Welcome to our uh, presenters who will be presenting on uh, APH Low Vision Exam. What is it? Who needs it? And what comes next? Um, and so I'm going to let um, Dr. Malkin and David go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Leah. You're welcome. So just very, very briefly, uh, while uh, Dr. Malkin opens up her PowerPoint slides, uh, so my name is David Bradburn. I, I work with the organization Humanware. Uh, we are a, a partner with APH. I'm very happy to be with you all today. Um, this presentation will be uh, split in two parts. The first part, and certainly uh, the major part of this presentation, will be conducted by Dr. Malkin. She'll introduce herself in just a second. Uh, talking about, as you know, uh, the about a low vision exam and how it's different from a routine one, among many other topics. Uh, we'll conclude the presentation today with a kind of a highlight of a couple of digital video magnifiers that uh, can be helpful to people with low vision. And that's the part that I'll do. So you'll hear from me again a little bit later. But without further ado, uh, Dr. Malkin, take it away, please. And you're on mute, uh, Lexi. Okay, hopefully the screen share is now working, working in the great. correct format. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as David said, welcome it to is. the webinar. Uh, it looked like there are a lot of people who work in the community with people with vision impairment. So um, please feel free to type in questions in the chat if you have them. Uh, some of the introductory information is targeted more to our adult consumers who are on here. So hopefully we will reach everybody with the information we're sharing today. So I wanna start by defining what low vision is. Uh, I think that as you talk about low vision, you're gonna hear a lot of different definitions. Your ophthalmologist may define it a certain way. A teacher of the visually impaired may define it a certain way and a person living with low vision may define it a certain way. So to kind of equalize our definition and to start the webinar, we think about low vision as permanently impaired vision. So that is vision loss that cannot be corrected by standard glasses, surgery, medications, or contact lenses. In conditions with low vision, people may use standard glasses, they may have surgery or take medications, or use specialty contact lenses, but none of those things bring the vision back to what we would consider normal. Um, a key for me as someone who works with people with low vision on a daily basis is that there's no magic number to define low vision. So you can have excellent visual acuity, and we'll talk more about what visual acuity means in a few minutes. You can have excellent numbers um, at your eye exam, but may have reduced visual function. And so when we think about low vision, we really want to focus on function and how are you doing with the vision that you have. It's also important to know that most people with vision impairment have some usable vision. So very few people with vision impairment are totally blind in the sense that they cannot see light or shadows or shapes. Uh, there are definitely people who are totally blind, but most people do have some usable vision, and that's where the low vision exam comes in, is how do we maximize that usable vision? So when we're talking about vision impairment, as I mentioned, visual acuity is different than visual function. So you can see on the left, I have a picture of a visual acuity chart. And uh, for those of you who are not able to see the image, it's a series of letters starting with bigger letters at the top, working their way to smaller letters at the bottom. It's black letters on a white background. So that's how we measure visual acuity. What letters can you see on an eye chart? It's looking at our high contrast, detailed vision. Visual function is how useful is the vision that we can measure. What tasks are you able to perform with the vision that you have? And the photograph on the right is showing a person sitting in an, uh, an armchair reading with a gooseneck lamp over her shoulder. So in her case, um, she's not wearing any glasses. She needs that lighting. So probably she has pretty good visual function. Uh, 
we don't know what her visual acuity is, but we need to think about those two terms separately to understand what is going on with a person's vision. And we have to think about what causes visual impairment. So no two conditions are exactly the same, just as no two people with the same visual acuity will function the same. So visual impairment can be caused by inherited eye diseases. So in some cases, this is congenital conditions, things people are born with. In other cases, it is hereditary, but develops later in life. Something like Stargardt maculopathy would be an inherited eye disease that typically develops in either childhood or the teenage years, sometimes a little bit later. Albinism would be something that is congenital and inherited. So that is from the time of birth. More commonly, vision impairment is caused by acquired conditions. So that is sometimes cataracts, although Usually uh, in, in the United States, cataracts are something that can be treated with surgery, but not always. In addition, age-related macular degeneration, and diabetes, and glaucoma are some of the most common acquired conditions that cause vision impairment. Patients also lose vision from trauma, um, both directly to the eye as well as trauma to the visual system in general. So traumatic brain injury, birth injury, or stroke can lead to problems in the visual system. So for those of you who are professionals in the vision rehab community, you don't really need this overview, but for those of you who are consumers, this may be very helpful for you. Um, as we talk about conditions and as we talk about the low vision exam, it's just a, a quick sketch of the eye that the NIH provides. And it goes through the major structures. So over on the left, we have the front of the eye. This is the clear surface called the cornea. The cornea is where light first enters the eye. Uh, you don't typically think much about the cornea unless you have a disease like keratoconus or other corneal conditions. We work our way backwards and we have the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. The pupil, that's the typically the black part of the eye. It gets bigger in dim light and smaller in bright light. Uh, works sort of like an aperture on a camera, controlling the amount of light coming into the eye. Sitting just behind the pupil is the lens. When you develop a cataract, it's in the lens inside the eye. And that's where they would remove your natural lens and put in a clear plastic lens afterwards. The center of the eye, um, it's shaded light blue here. It's kind of this bigger area. That's the vitreous humor. It's a jelly-like substance that helps the eye keep shape when you're younger and it starts to become more liquid as you get older. And then the red lining the back of the eye is the retina. And there's a very small portion marked on the picture for the macula and the fovea. So when you develop macular degeneration, it's referring to this very specific part of the retina. It's one sub area of the retina. And then finally, all of the information that has started coming in through the tear film and the cornea all the way to the retina, then gets processed by the optic nerve, which is sent directly to the brain. So just so you have a sense of the flow of information coming into the eye. So we have a lot of structures that are what we call refracting elements. Those are the elements that actually bend the light and focus the light. And then we have the processing elements. So things like the retina and the optic nerve that process the light once it hits the eye. Uh, it's a very oversimplified version, but should help as we talk about the different conditions. So going back to what I had mentioned in terms of the common conditions that can impact vision and cause vision impairment, we'll start with cataracts because those are incredibly common in the population. Everybody gets cataracts if they live long enough. Cataracts are a clouding of the lens inside the eye. And usually people complain about fogginess in their vision, kind of like looking through a dirty windshield. 
glare sensitivity, and an overall blur to the vision, both distance and near. As I mentioned earlier, it's typically treatable with surgery, but not always. The images on this slide the lower right is just showing a really out of focus image of two kids at a playground, each holding a ball. Um, that's an attempt to simulate that hazy or foggy vision. And the top image is showing the increase in cataracts as the population ages. So much smaller percent, around one or 2% of the population in between ages 40 and 50. And when we get up to 80 plus, we're above 60% in most cases that have cataracts. I'm gonna go through a couple more conditions and then we'll pause for some questions. Uh, so the next condition that I mentioned is age-related macular degeneration. And this is a condition that is much more common as people get older, hence age-related. And it primarily affects the central vision or the macula, that small part of the retina that I showed on the diagram. It typically affects both eyes, but it may start with one, so it may not be a perfectly symmetric disease process. Macular degeneration can be wet or dry, and you'll hear people talk about, you know, I have the wet form, so I'm getting injections in my eye, or I have the dry form, and so I'm taking just the vitamins. Uh, it used to be maybe 15 years ago that people would say the wet form is the bad form uh, because there was no treatment available. The dry form was the good form because you had less vision loss. Things have changed quite a bit. So the wet form does have treatment. Um, it is treated with injections, which help stabilize the condition. The dry form is a much slower, gradual vision loss, but at the present time is only treatable with preventative medications like the ocular vitamins to attempt to prevent the shift over to the wet form. Age-related macular degeneration is most common in Caucasians and then in Asians and then people who are Black or of African descent. We don't know a whole lot about how to prevent age-related macular degeneration other than encouraging people to quit smoking or never start smoking. Uh, smoking is a big risk factor and it's the only preventable risk factor that we know of. And then family history is also a risk factor. We obviously can't change that piece. Macular degeneration on its own never leads to total blindness, but that loss of central vision really impacts how people function. And we'll talk about that quite a bit. Uh, so this is, on the right, we have uh, the bar graph again, showing particularly in the Caucasian population, when we get to over age 80, close to 15% of the population has age-related macular degeneration. It goes up for all races as people get older. And then the bottom picture is showing those two children at the playground again, but this time their faces are totally blurred out. So you can just see hands holding the balls, but you can't make out either face at all. I'll pause for a moment. Any questions before I go on to other, the, the next couple of conditions? Okay, um, I don't see any questions in the chat just yet. So I guess just keep going. Perfect. And I will keep going. Will, yep, people will put them in there eventually, so. <laughs> Not a problem. I just okay. wanna make sure that I'm, yeah. I'm cognizant of it, so. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, so the next condition I will mention uh, is diabetic retinopathy. This is tricky because unlike macular degeneration that we know only affects the central vision, diabetic retinopathy can cause central or peripheral vision loss. So it can affect the center or the side vision. People who have diabetes often report fluctuations in their vision, um, especially if their blood sugar fluctuates. So it's a frustrating condition for the patient because they can't always predict how they're going to see. One of the biggest risks in diabetic retinopathy is that there will be new blood vessels that grow in the retina. So what's happening is the retina is not getting enough oxygen. And so it develops all these new blood vessels, which you, you would think, oh, that's great, new blood vessels, that's a nice way to compensate. But actually, 
these new blood vessels don't belong there and they become very leaky and sometimes will even scar and cause traction. And that can lead to a detachment of the retina. Uh, retinal detachments are a common cause of blindness in people with diabetes. In addition, that leaking can cause swelling so you can get very distorted central vision. Some people with diabetic retinopathy describe seeing sort of like a Swiss cheese appearance. They have pieces of their vision that are very good and pieces of their vision that aren't so good. And they have to really move their eyes and move their head to find good usable vision. Um, diabetic retinopathy risk increases with the length of time that you have had diabetes. And it also increases with more poorly controlled blood sugar. So the better controlled the blood sugar, the less likely that someone will have problems related to diabetes in their eyes. Um, in terms of the bar graph that I included here, this is just showing that over time, this one is a time-based graph rather than an age-based graph. So it's showing the increase in cases of diabetic retinopathy from 2010 to 2030 to 2050. Uh, the cases are going up significantly. And then finally, I will talk about glaucoma, which is another common cause of low vision. Glaucoma encompasses a whole group of diseases and they all cause a progressive irreversible optic neuropathy. Most cases are caused by open angle glaucoma and that's describing something in the structure of the eye when they say open angle. People are at highest risk for glaucoma after the age of 60 uh, people who are Black or Hispanic, and people with family history of glaucoma. One of the keys to glaucoma is that it starts without any symptoms, even if damage has already occurred. Because it's such a slow process, people may not be aware that they've lost peripheral vision before they're diagnosed with glaucoma. So that really the only way to prevent this kind of vision loss is through routine eye exams, uh, where someone is having the optic nerve assessed. So it's more than just a pressure check. It's a number of factors that can lead to glaucoma, but it's that careful assessment of the optic nerve that is really important. And in this bar graph on the bottom, it's showing the red bars are the black population. So significantly higher than all other populations, but all races have a higher prevalence of glaucoma by the time we get to that 75 plus age range. So what does all of this mean? So I mentioned that we really don't wanna focus on the numbers, we wanna think about the function um, and that there's a number of conditions and they can affect different parts of the vision. But let's at least talk about what the numbers could mean. So when you think about your 20 over something number, uh, we consider 2020 to be quote unquote normal vision. So what that means is that at 20 feet, you can see the same as that standard observer can see at 20 feet. If your vision drops to 20 over 40, typically in most parts of the US and Canada, you can drive without restrictions. And what 2040 means is that the standard observer can stand at 40 feet and you need to be at 20 feet. So you need to be twice as close to see the information. 2060 is roughly where people can stop reading ordinary newsprint. When we get to 2070, this is where we start talking about Medicare's definition of low vision and their standard approval of low vision rehabilitation services like home occupational therapy. And when we get to worse than 2100, you become eligible for blindness related benefits uh, and can be considered legally blind. When I say blindness related benefits, this often means working with your state association for the blind. It may also mean qualifying for paratransit services or other services. Now, many of you may know the, the number of 2200, and you may be thinking, what is she talking about at 2100? 
but it's actually according to the US Social Security Administration. In 2007, they updated the criteria and stated that it is worse than 2100 that allows you to be eligible. This is based on the fact that most clinics are using more advanced testing techniques that have more lines between 2100 and 2200. So it was ensuring that everyone continues to receive the benefits that they were eligible for. And legal blindness falls right in the middle of visual impairment. So you can be visually impaired and better than legally blind, and you can be visually impaired and worse than legally blind. It's kind of an arbitrary number that was set out by the Social Security Administration for blindness related benefits in the United States. Um, and I think I did see some questions, so I will pause for a moment. Okay, I'm taking me a second there to get off. I was like clicking unmute, unmute. Um, okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So we have a couple of questions. One of them, is there a higher percentage of glaucoma in men or women? Um, glaucoma, they don't actually, there's not a huge predilection for a male versus female. Uh, it depends on the type of glaucoma, but sort of your general primary open angle glaucoma, it's more uh, the racial distinction that affects it. Okay, and then um, another question, is there more information about macular edema, which is the problem that I have, which the person has who put the question in there? Yeah, sure. So what I, part of what I had mentioned with diabetic retinopathy was that central swelling. Um, so I'll click back over there really quickly. Uh, so it was kind of a, a sub bullet here. The swelling can cause distorted or distorting of the vision. And anytime that I talk about macular degeneration or anything that impacts central vision, macular edema would fall into that category. So once we shift past the disease states, we're really going to go into the function part. And I'll talk about uh, the structure of the eye and the part of the eye that actually does that kind of seeing. So macular edema is treatable, but it doesn't always go away or resolve to normal vision. And macular edema impacts that center, that detailed vision, um, facial identification. So we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Great. Um, let me just make sure I don't leave any questions out. Nope. Okay. I think we're good to keep going. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So who is affected by low vision? Uh, so the statistics that we have right now come from two different sources. One is our understanding of who would potentially have low vision. So knowing X number of people in the population are expected to have glaucoma or diabetes. And we know that a certain number of those people will have low vision. And we also have statistics on who actually shows up for low vision exams. So in terms of who comes in for low, for low vision exams, that tends to be older adults. The median age of people who come in and say, you know, I'm having trouble with my low vision and I want a low vision exam. Their median age is 75. So a lot of people older than that and some people younger than that, but that is definitely that older adult category. And more women than men come in for low vision services. It's about 68% female across the major studies that we've looked at. Part of that is thought to be that you know, women do live longer than men. And if we're looking at older adults, there may be more women than men who come in. Uh, macular degeneration is more common in females than in males, again, because women tend to live longer. But a lot of this is actually that women seek out the service more than men. So that 68% is beyond the difference in who actually has the disease. And we know that the prevalence of vision impairment increases pretty dramatically after the age of 75. So this graph on the bottom of the slide here shows a percent of people at age 55, it's about less than 1% of people have vision impairment. 
And it goes up dramatically. When we hit age 75, there's a steep slope to the curve towards close to 10% of people having vision impairment. Uh, this particular slide is looking at the white population, uh, but we see similar trends in other populations just shifted slightly younger due to the fact that glaucoma and diabetes affect populations slightly younger than what is shown here. And I'll pause again because I did, I'm seeing the chat window flash. So I think there's some more questions coming in. Yes, there are. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, let's see. I'm going to scroll up just to make sure again that I don't miss. Okay, the first one after the, the macular edema one we have is, um, is the 2100 definition for blindness without correction? That is an excellent question. So the 2100 is based on the best corrected vision in the best seeing eye. So anytime we talk about legal blindness, it's talking about the best eye and wearing best correction, both visual field definition and visual acuity. I only included the acuity here. Uh, visual field, it is less than 20 degrees of visual field in the best seeing eye. Great, thanks for that. Um, the next question, <clears throat> we are always told that legal blindness is 2200, not 2100, best corrected. So that, that I don't know if it's a statement or a question, but I guess, can you address that? <laughs> yeah, uh, so that actually, it did change in 2007. It's um, It says specifically in the social security statutes it has to be worse than 2100. So the patient cannot read a single letter on the 2100 line. Um, it is still, everyone still says 2200 when you, know, you kind of read the forms, you look at registration guides, but if you actually go to the social security statutes, it's worse than 2100. Uh, it's primarily impacting people in low vision clinics because we have those more specialized charts with more lines, um, what was happening is people were becoming unregistered after going to a more specialized clinic. And that was not a great thing for people and acce accessing services. So if you're unsure, if you're working with someone or you yourself have vision that might be in between, uh, you can ask your provider to look into that. And, and I would even recommend getting a low vision exam because low vision specialists are pretty comfortable with the, the we say new definition, but it's been 14 years, uh, still feels new. Every <laughs> still, time I give this talk, it is new to somebody. <clears throat> yep. <laughs> Takes a while to kind of get it out there, right? You know, yeah. and <laughs> over and over. 2200 and 20 degrees is a nice, easy round number for people to remember. So that's it, true. I like that. I'm going to use that with my students. <laughs> 20, yeah, 20 degrees and 2200. Is a, that's a really good way to remember that. Thanks. Um, there, there was a question here. I, it looks like Monica was trying to ask, where can I get the low vision exam? And I'm not sure like how, how to address that. Um, I um, guess well, we'll, right. we'll talk a bit about how you can find low vision providers uh, a go. bit later. So yeah, we'll okay. get there. Great, great. Okay. And then the next question is, what is the youngest age someone should get a low vision exam? Um, I'm a preschool TVI who does FBAs and LMAs for my students. Should they also be getting low vision exams or not until later in life? That's a good question. Um, yeah, so I would say that I just, we were just talking about a case yesterday that they were doing a low vision exam on a seven month old um, to help the teacher of the visually impaired understand a bit more of what was going on in the case. So I would say um, as soon as someone is diagnosed with vision impairment, it's worthwhile to at least talk to a low vision specialist near you, uh, you know, making sure that they have pediatric experience if you're talking about a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old. Um, I think it's important because there are some other clinical assessments that maybe will add to your functional vision assessment and your learning media assessment. Um, perhaps checking for, you know, need for glasses and looking at those kinds of things uh, in addition to a more clinical visual field, uh, some contrast sensitivity that might put numbers to some of the pieces that you've been finding in your own um, assessments. 
Yeah, and um, sometimes and then, just for oh, parent education as well. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> um, there is a question here, and, and you may have addressed this already. Is there is there still the border of 2200 for legal blindness? Uh, yep, so that's the one that it has been updated. So it's worse than 2100. Um, the next one, does trying eye supplements, and they, for example, AREDS, A-R-E-D-S-2, prevent or delay the onset of macular degeneration? Uh, so the studies on AREDS only looked at people who already had macular degeneration, and that particular type of vitamin helps prevent progression to the severe stage or the conversion to wet but the studies have not shown that it prevents developing the disease. So if you have a family history and you're worried about getting macular degeneration, um, I always just encourage a healthy, high antioxidant diet. Um, don't smoke and get your routine eye exams to make sure you're not developing the early form where it would then be of benefit to add the vitamins. Okay, um, next question. Um, it, well, I don't know, it's more of a comment. It was because Snell and charts had nothing between 2100 and 2200. Right. Yes. That, okay. so that's why I was saying that the 2100 came about <clears throat> when there were more charts so that people were not disqualified for going to someone who had either a digital chart or right. uh, yeah, different, different charts. Okay. Um, then there was another one here. Please know that the definition for legal blindness to be counted on the APH legally blind census for students especially is 2200. So that was a comment in the in the chat box. Um, uh, let's see, in a regular eye exam, the chart jumps from 2100 to 2200. Therefore, if the acuity is worse than 2100, it will be 2200 in their chart. If you use low vision charts, you can get more accurate acuity between those two numbers. At least yes. that's what I was told. That's what it is. <laughs> that's yep, that, that's, exact, that's okay. exactly the point that I was making. And you know, actually a lot of a lot of states request that we write 2200, mm. even when the vision is something like 20 over 125, mm -hmm. because they don't want to have confusion in the registration. Um, I almost Got left you. the slide as 2200, but I wanted to be accurate. Yeah. Uh, but we do hear that from a lot of states. They say, even if they measure somewhere in between, call it 2200 to avoid the confusion in registration. Yeah, and that's helpful because as a TBI, sometimes we, we may get a different, you know, in, in our setting, get a different acuity versus what comes to us. So that makes sense. Okay, I gotcha. Um, there's another question. What about high blood pressure? Does that affect AMD? Um, so, they don't know a lot about the impact of high blood pressure and macular degeneration, uh, mm. but there, any time that there is reduced blood flow or less high quality blood flow to the eye, there can be an impact. So controlled blood pressure will, uh, it's not going to prevent AMD if you were going to get it, but perhaps it will slow um, other retinal conditions and other problems you can have. You can, definitely have what we call hypertensive retinopathy. Mm. So high blood pressure can impact the retina. Okay, great. Um, another question from Amy Brewer. Uh, would a low vision exam for a student with progressive optic atrophy be recommended? And I assume yes. So if so, yes. how often do low vision exams need to be updated? Uh, so that I, as we start talking about the actual low vision exam shortly, um, I would say that it's a pretty iterative process. So it depends on the patient. Mm. Um, some patients will come in to see me every two to three months if they have a lot of complex needs, variable vision, lots of goals. Um, I have some patients with impairments that they're quite comfortable with and they see me once every one to two years. So it really depends on the patient. Uh, so that initial exam helps us understand, you know, what else do we, do we need to be looking at? But at a minimum, I would say every one to two years, many, many cases are seen more frequently than that to address the range of goals. Okay. Yep. And I think you answered the, the, the last question that I see here is how often should low vision exams be performed? It sounds like you addressed that 
Yeah, and I, I think with kids in the school system, it's going to be a little bit less frequent that they're doing the exam with me because there are so many other people involved in these functional vision assessments and learning media assessments. So um, adults who are not having TVI services or who maybe aren't working with vision rehab therapy, they may need more regular exams than someone who is working with a TVI on a, a weekly basis or a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. um, and I, there, then there's just one comment here. Thank you for addressing the new definition of legal blindness. This update was not widely known when it happened. I'm glad you addressed it. Many in our field are still unaware. Thanks. So that yes. was it. No problem. <laughs> All right. Now we can move on. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So let's move on a bit more into the, the function area because I'm just watching our time too, but I, I think we'll make sure we get a chance to get to David as well. Um, so people are affected because they have difficulty seeing detail or reduced acuity, as I mentioned. People may have difficulty with their peripheral vision. And many times people with vision impairment have reduced contrast sensitivity or a reduced ability to see when things are not that pure black and white. So that's sort of a clinical definition, but what does it mean in the real world? For those of you who are professionals in this field, you know all of this already, but you know, reduced acuity, reduced contrast, reduced field impacts someone's ability to drive. Uh, sometimes it impacts their ability to meet the legal driving requirement, but many times they can meet that requirement but cannot drive safely. Um, or maybe they are driving safely, but they're not meeting their state or province's legal requirements. So driving is a pretty hot topic in low vision and a big part of what we address in the exam. It can impact people to read both spot reading, reading a label, reading a medication bottle, and continuous reading. So somebody's ability to pick up a book, a newspaper, a legal document, and read for more than that quick spot reading activity. It impacts general activities of daily living, cooking, telling when meat is cooked through, when the oven is set to the right temperature, that the food is not expired by, you know, if you can't always tell by smell. It can impact the ability to see if clothes are clean, if the kitchen has been cleaned thoroughly, medication management, recognizing people's faces, and mobility, so how people can walk around independently. Can they see curbs, steps, stairs, or are they at risk for falls or tripping over something or bumping into something? When you take all of those things together, it can also lead to an overall reduction in independence. Uh, we see increased rates of depression and increased social isolation in people who have vision impairment. So to address that, that's really where low vision rehabilitation comes into it. So the terms do vary across states, provinces, and systems. So you'll see lots of different descriptions of low vision and low vision rehabilitation. But the key is that all of these professionals are working to help someone make the most of their remaining vision. It's teaching strategies to achieve goals, helping people restore or maintain independence, and what I think is most important here is actually there have been studies that have shown that people who receive some type of vision rehabilitation have a lower incidence of depression. So in addition to addressing the independence factors, we're also addressing the depression factor and hopefully the social isolation by allowing people to get out of their houses, to connect to support groups and to re-engage with society when they may be withdrawing a little bit as the vision is getting worse. Um, the low vision exam includes more than just your regular eye exam. So we are usually beginning the exam with a very detailed functional history, asking how people are doing with all of those tasks I already described. We also do a detailed glasses prescription. We assess low vision devices, so magnifiers, telescopes, things like that. And we may do specialized testing like more detailed visual fields, reading speed uh, calculations, 
identification of scotomas or blind spots in the vision and mapping those out to teach the person with vision impairment how to learn to either work with it or work around their scotoma. Uh, we also include other areas as parts of low vision rehabilitation. So the other professionals that we work with will be looking at independent living skills, orientation and mobility training, uh, connection to community resources like the talking books library or support groups, and then a lot of counseling and patient education that comes across all of the different professionals who are involved. So as I mentioned, the low vision exam is different in a number of ways. So it's the eye and medical history, that detailed functional history, the functional testing, the evaluation with low vision devices, uh, prescription of low vision devices. There are some cases where devices are covered by certain insurances. And the low vision providers tend to be pretty familiar with what is covered. So they can help you understand if your insurance will give you some coverage there. Uh, it's rare, but there are situations where there is coverage. Training with the devices and patient education and then referral for other services. So referrals to O&M specialists, that orientation and mobility, referral to a teacher of the visually impaired if you are school age, uh, referral to a vision rehab professional if you're working in the community or to an occupational therapist to help you learn to be most functional with your vision. Um, that's not an exhaustive list of the professionals. So if I left anyone out, I apologize. Um, yeah, referral to assistive technology. There's lots of different components that come after the low vision exam once the goals and the needs have been identified. And when I mentioned low vision devices, so um, you know, they're specific to each person and to each goal. There's no one size fits all solution or very, very rarely is there a one size fits all solution. So devices tend to include things like hand magnifiers, which in that top picture, we've got a hand magnifier, a little pocket one. Um, they also include digital magnifiers, which we'll talk about shortly. Computer technology. Uh, there's a large print keyboard pictured here down at the bottom telescopes, uh, there's a pair of glasses with telescopes on them, binocular systems, optical character recognition like text to speech or scanning something and having it read out loud, talking books, and a huge range of apps. Those are all types of low vision devices. In addition, there's a whole lot of non-opticals. So large button watches, talking watches, braille watches, um, high contrast tools to help like letter writing guides, uh, bold pens. These are all considered low vision devices or tools that you might be exposed to in the low vision exam. Uh, so I will pause, I, I saw it flash again. I think there's another question before I go to this next slide. Um, yes, the, the question that's there is um, where do you get low vision examinations? Okay, so we're still, I promise we're getting there. <laughs> Um, okay. So, you know, it, it sounds like people are not afraid to ask for help. So that is great. Um, but that is one of the keys. You know, there are simple adaptations that can make things a lot easier. So even before you get a low vision exam, um, you can look at your environment and you can make some changes that help make you feel safer and more confident. And actually on the Vision Aware website, they have the information from Making Life More Livable, the book that Maureen Duffy wrote, which is an excellent source. And there's a lot of information on the Vision Aware website of environmental modifications you can make. Um, so some of those basic principles are things like improving visibility, adding contrast, using your other senses. So um, this bottom right picture has a bump dot. So it's a raised bright yellow yellow dot that you can use to both feel and potentially visually set your oven temperature. Um, you can use occupational therapy or state blindness services to help you do this in your home. And the big question that people have wanted to know for the last 15 minutes or so, uh, how do I find a low vision specialist? So your state services or the CNIB for those of you in Canada 
um, can connect you to people who provide low vision services. If you're a veteran, VA hospitals have low vision services. If you're not sure um, how to even start with your state services, most large ophthalmology hospitals have a low vision department and you can call and ask. If you live a distance from one of those hospitals, still call, they may be able to give you the information. Senior centers and health fairs usually can give a list of low vision providers, um, potentially calling your local Lions Club, although that's still a work in process. There are local chapters of the National Federation for the Blind, um, the American Council of the Blind and other organizations in the US that can likely direct you to local low vision providers. And general support groups for conditions like macular degeneration or for adults with vision impairment, uh, those are likely to help you connect as well. Um, if you're in the school system and you're working with a teacher of the visually impaired, typically your TVI will have someone they've worked with in the community, um, or they'll have a colleague in another location who can help track down a low vision provider. Um, there's not one centralized list of low vision providers across the country, but there are a lot of different resources. Um, I can type my email address into the chat as well. And uh, I've been practicing long enough that I, I do tend to know low vision providers in a lot of different places, or I know who to ask. So if you're not able to find someone and you have this need and really desire this service, which I think anyone with a vision impairment should get a low vision exam to figure out you know, what gaps are there and what they're doing, uh, send me an email and I can help you track someone down as well. Um, and keep in mind those general community resources like your na the National Library Service, your State Talking Books Library, NFB Newsline for auditory news information. Um, as I mentioned, the CNIB in Canada. Uh, we had someone from Australia or New Zealand. So Vision Australia is uh, really active. I don't know their um, equivalent in New Zealand, but Vision Australia can get you that information. I mean, Lions Clubs throughout the world can often connect you to whoever is providing low vision services. Uh, so low vision exams really look at how you use your vision. They provide recommendations like those tools I mentioned. There's a huge range of tools available to help both visually and using your other senses. And don't be afraid to ask for help or ask for a referral for low vision services if you're struggling and if you think I might benefit from that, you probably would. So go ahead and make that appointment and the low vision specialist can connect you to whoever else you may need to be working with in the community. So I will stop my screen share and answer some questions before we turn it over to David. Yep, there was a, another question put in here. Um, let's see, Nanette asked this question. How often should a low vision exam be repeated? It seems sometimes with delayed time in receiving equipment, the items are not effective or helpful due to disease progression. Are they updated or recalled for additional um, low vision exams? Yeah, so um, with people who have progressive conditions, I see them fairly regularly. So sometimes, I'll make an additional, I'll make an initial recommendation and I'll do a follow up in six weeks or in three months. Um, for kind of a typical, let's say macular degeneration, uh, I recommend that touching base with the patient at least every six months for something more like um, oculocutaneous albinism, non progressive congenital impairment. That might be a patient I see once every one to two years. Uh, but my kind of rule of thumb is anytime the vision changes or a new goal develops, someone should come in and be assessed if they're not already working with other professionals who are updating the recommendations. Because uh, we, yeah, as you mentioned, we may need to change the equipment being used, new magnifiers, new devices, or perhaps knowing it's a progressive condition, we would make a specific recommendation so that that device will last longer through the condition. Um, and I think that will be in David's few minutes, he'll talk about some of that as well. And 
um, I do see Monica's information there. So I am going to copy your email address if I can, and I can send you an email and, and help you get connected. Yeah, and I think Monica's asking that question, can I get a referral through my eye doctors or my insurance company? So I, you're going to address that with her? Yes, the, yeah, okay. I'll address All right. um, it. Okay. It's, it's a sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yes, I do use the Leia charts for younger Perfect. Patients, we use Leia, we use Teller, we use HOTV. We, we've got a whole cabinet full of acuity and contrast tests for um, kids who may cannot read the Snellen chart or an ETDRS chart. Great. Well, thank you so much. And I guess you are handing it over to David. I am. Yeah, yes. I can yeah. reshare my screen if you want. or uh, uh, I can share mine. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay. All right. Let me just share my slide here. And actually, I think I need to share the other screen. One second, sorry. Okay. Try this there you go, perfect. Second. Hang on. There we go. Hopefully you can now see the title slide. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Uh, Dr. Malkin, that was a really excellent, informative presentation. And uh, like many others, it seems, uh, I also learned a lot. There were a couple of things that were new to me, especially the, uh, the new definition of legal blindness. That was, um, that was great to know. I've been saying 2,200 for years. So in terms of um, the, this kind of final segment of our presentation, so uh, we heard, of course, this reference to dig digital magnifiers, often also called electronic uh, video magnifiers or uh, just magnifiers. Um, we don't tend to think of optical ones in the assistive technology space. I did want to just kind of show and highlight uh, a couple of different solutions. Um, before I do that, and I do actually have the ability to connect some of these magnifiers to my computer, so you'll see exactly what they are magnifying. Uh, I just want to touch on some of these considerations that I've highlighted here. So if a digital magnifier or a video, an electronic video magnifier is right for you, some of the things that you're probably going to want to consider is, well, certainly your needs. So what are you hoping to accomplish? Uh, and that will segue nicely into these next points, such as the size and weight of the device. You know, is this something that you're looking to kind of put in your pocket or in a, in a handbag or something and kind of carry around with you. So whether you're in a restaurant or a store or somewhere else, you can kind of just quickly take it out and magnify something in a hurry. Uh, or are you looking for something that is more of a kind of a desktop uh, unit? And I have photographs on the right side of this slide, just kind of showing some images. Uh, the one in the upper right is a actually a portable uh, desktop machine. So that's a device which I will be showing in a moment. Uh, it can fold down flat when not in use, so you can transport it around. The other two devices that you see pictured, the, the one that is in the kind of upper left is an image of a five inch magnifier. So when we talk about inches, we're referring to the diagonal measurement of the screen. So a five inch is, uh, is at the kind of the lower end of the scale of digital magnifiers in terms of size. Uh, but uh, it is something that is going to be the most portable. The device that's at the bottom is an image of an eight inch uh, magnifier. Uh, one of the characteristics of these types of magnifiers, by the way, when we're thinking about ones that are designed to be handheld, is that they feature a foot stand that opens and closes. Um, and when it's in the open position, it allows the device to sit on its own on top of the reading material that you're looking to, uh, to magnify. Magnification range varies, I would say, quite greatly actually uh, from one device to another. So the bigger the screen, usually the, the bigger the magnification range is. So if we're thinking about some of the smaller devices, you know, they'll perhaps magnify up to about 20x or 20 times normal size. With some of the larger screens, they can go to 45 times and some can go even as large as 70 or 80 times magnification. It's worth pointing out though, 
that those numbers aren't things that you should be too focused on. The image quality, ultimately, I would say is the most important thing. So getting to try some of these devices can be helpful. Uh, if we were to actually set these units uh, to the maximum magnification, as I'll be happy to demonstrate in just a moment, you will perhaps fit a single word on the screen. And uh, we heard Dr. Malkin earlier talk about one of the measurements that, that, that happens during a vision or low vision exam is reading speed. That's also very important when considering what you want to accomplish with these devices. Because if your reading speed is only 20 words a minute, I don't think I have to explain to you how long it's going to take to read a page from a book. It's okay for spot reading. So if what you want to do is to magnify the instructions on a, on a pill uh, container, as demonstrated in the, uh, the picture here on the slide, uh, that's okay, um, even if you are reading quite slowly. Distance viewing, uh, it's not included with every digital magnifier, but certainly it is a function or a feature of the devices that I'm showing today. Uh, distance viewing is helpful for simply looking outside the window. Um, perhaps you're, you're seated uh, in a room with, uh, with a view outside, and uh, if the doorbell goes, you want to see what's outside, you could direct your magnifier to look outside and see what's there. Uh, of course, all of this will come down to the big question about portability. So any one of these devices can be moved around, uh, but only a couple of them are going to fit uh, comfortably inside a small bag or a backpack or something like that. So it's worth considering. And then the final point here, and this I think is also closely related to your reading speed. Um, and that is something else that Dr. Malkin mentioned before, uh, optical character recognition or OCR for short and text-to-speech or TTS for short. So when people talk about TTS, this is simply a synthetic speech that is being generated by a device, invariably a computer, but, but also uh, it's a standard feature of most mobile devices these days. So if you have an iPhone, for example, if you've ever heard um, you know, Siri speaking to you or you've asked Siri to do something, that's an example of a synthetic voice. It's a very good quality one, but it is synthetic still. Uh, and so OCR is the ability to recognize text on a, on a, on a page uh, or a screen and convert it into words that you can hear as words are highlighted for you. So if your reading speed is quite slow, but you do have a longer document to read, OCR will be your friend. Um, I will come back to this slide at the very, very end and that's just to say that there is an opportunity for anybody who is interested in a low vision device from Humanware. We have several. Uh, you can save 10% uh, through the end of June. Again, I'll come back to this uh, in a little bit. But first, what I want to do is to end the slideshow. And I'm going to switch to a different application. Let me bring it over here. Okay. So hopefully what you are now seeing is what appears to be a page of text on the screen. This page of text is actually um, uh, a, a page that is on um, a magnifier. So we have that device that I was telling you that can fold. I'm gonna turn my web camera around. So in fact, let me just stop sharing very, very, or sharing, okay. All right, I just wanna just focus on the video just for a second so you can see it. So what is to the right of me on my uh, desk in my home office here uh, is a device, this is Reveal 16. This is uh, what I was describing as being a, a, a portable or a transportable desktop unit. So this device, the screen will actually fold down. I'm not gonna go through the whole process because I want to use it but it could actually fold down completely. Uh, you can put it into a carry case uh, or a roll along carry case and take it from point A to point B. Also here, by the way, just a quick plug for that book that you heard um, being spoken about, which is The Making Life More Livable uh, by Maureen Duffy. I did actually buy a copy after um, hearing about it the first time from Dr. Malkin, and it is a great read, lots of really good information in here uh, for anybody dealing with low vision. 
In any event, uh, as we look at the screen of the Reveal 16, there are uh, a couple of um, buttons. I'm just gonna move the camera around a little bit more. So there is a control, it's an orange dial. And as I turn the dial left or right, it increases or decreases the magnification level of whatever it is that I'm, I'm reading. There is a button to the right of that. And as I change it, it will change to one of several different high contrast color modes. So black on yellow, yellow on black, very, very popular color combination for low vision. And these high contrast modes make the text really kind of much look much sharper. It's much easier to read, uh, but you can choose the, uh, the combination that you like best. The reading material, meanwhile, is underneath the screen. So with this type of device, I'm moving my reading material or the object of interest um, uh, and, uh, and then just look at it. So I'm going to just turn back to me just for one second. I know there are a couple of questions. I'm going to come to you in just one moment because what I want to do now is to share my screen one more time. And now I'm going to switch back to this view. So what you're seeing now, you'll see that if I'm moving this around with my hands, you can see my fingers uh, coming up here. I'm holding the paper to move it around. So as I increase the magnification, if you look to the, the lower portion of the screen, there is an indicator in large print telling us, it does disappear after a second, but it tells us what magnification that we have chosen. If I change to a uh, high contrast, so in this case, white on black, I'm gonna increase now significantly. So I'm up to I'm up to 12 and a half times magnification. Uh, and and even in this high contrast mode, you'll start to see that the that the crispness of the text begins to degrade a little bit. And that is common. So here is regular color. Uh, this is just something printed on my uh, multifunction printer at my home office. So this is not going to be as good quality as you would find in a printed book from a publisher, but this is probably about on par with the type of quality you would find from newspaper print. Uh, so I'm going to just decrease the uh, the image just a little bit. I did want to say that, and you know, we spoke about this before that there is the ability with some of these devices. This is one of those. You're not going to hear it speaking, but the device is actually. Let me just turn the volume up. I'm not sure if it's coming through my headset. So I've gone into the, um, the, the menu, which I did just by pressing a small button on the front of the device. There's an option here with a camera. I just tap the screen. It says mode capture. And then what I see is a full page image of the document that I have here. Uh, on the left hand side are the on screen buttons that allow me to capture this page and convert it into speech. So the second button down, it's an image of a camera. I just tap it once. It makes a sound as if someone has just taken a photograph with a, with a real camera and it's just beeping periodically. It's telling me that the view is a full page. I'm gonna just turn the volume down just so I don't get disturbed here. Uh, and at this point, if I press the rightmost button on the screen, it will start to read to me. What is it? Who needs it? What comes next? Reading, writing, recognizing faces, watching TV. I'm going to pause it right there. So this was a page. I, I would say it took all of about five seconds to recognize all of the text on the page and convert it into a digital view. The advantage of this digital view, let me just turn it down, is that when I increase the magnification, you will notice there is no degradation in terms of image quality of these words. This is like making text as big as you could on your computer using Microsoft Word or something like this. Um, this, in the digital view, there is a limit. You can't magnify as large. Uh, but we do wrap the text around so everything kind of fits, so you shouldn't end up with words that are going off the screen or anything like that. Uh, but this is uh, very nice. So let me exit from there. I'm now just kind of back to the standard view. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect the cable. And this time what I'm going to do is connect it to one of the handheld devices. I want to show you 
the difference. So first of all, let me just turn my video camera. So uh, I wanna just kind of show this device. So here is an eight inch uh, handheld device. Again, there is a folding uh, foot stand here, which would allow it to sit on top of the text. There is an HDMI port here. I'm gonna connect my cable. And once I do so, the, the device now is connected to my, my computer screen. Now, the purpose of these HDMI connections, by the way, uh, is, is not to connect to computers necessarily, uh, but to connect to a larger HDMI monitor or TV. So if you buy even a portable device like this, but you've got access to a 50 inch or bigger uh, HDMI TV at home, assuming it's not on your wall or anything like that, you'll need a very long cable, but you could connect it up to those devices and then see things even larger if you want to. Uh, at this point though, so I, instead of moving the paper, I'm actually moving the magnifier. So I'm moving the device left and right to, uh, to read the materials. I do have um, buttons on here to change the color combination, just as you saw me do before with the reveal. Uh, I can also change the magnification. And just as we saw before, it will tell us what magnification level we are at. Uh, all of these devices are battery powered. I'm gonna just stop sharing because I know there's some questions here. So all of these devices are battery powered and depending on the device that you're getting, uh, they'll function anywhere from, from three hours to over five hours on a full charge. Uh, you do, of course, have a power uh, cable that comes with the device, so you can, you know, connect to a power source when you're at home or if you're in school uh, and you're using it going from class to class. Just find a power receptacle when you're in the, in the, the next room and uh, leave it there, uh, and then they'll charge. Uh, but in, in terms of that Reveal 16, um, it will, um, it'll pretty much run all day in a school setting. Uh, it's a, a very, very... Uh, Good battery system in there. Okay, so looking at the questions, uh, Alea, I'm not sure if you want to read them. I mean, I can certainly see them now. Oh, that I'm yeah, if you, if you can see them, go ahead. Yeah. Yep. I'm okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the first question uh, is how can you get a hold of one of these and what is the cost? Great question. So uh, in terms of our devices, uh, they're available, of course, through humanware uh, directly. And I will go back to that slide at the very end to repeat the. Uh, the web address, we do have distributors around the country. So depending on where you are, especially if you're interested in actually seeing one of these devices in person, uh, you can contact us and we can put you in contact with your local distributor. Uh, in terms of cost, so I'm gonna only focus on pricing in the USA. So for those people from different countries do know that pricing is almost certainly different. Um, by the time it's shipped and imported into different countries, the prices can, in fact, sometimes be a little bit higher. Um, but in the, in the U.S. anyway, if you're looking at, say, a five-inch device like the one that I'm holding, you're looking at a price of around $750. Um, in terms of a device like the Reveal 16, you're looking at around $3,000 for uh, the base model, and it can go up to about $4,000 if you're getting a, a model that comes with OCR and text-to-speech, there are other models available at different pricing. So again, it's, it's worth speaking to us or speaking to one of our distributors to kind of discuss your needs, and we can help kind of steer you in the right direction in terms of things that you might want to uh, consider. Uh, the next question is, how can we get one of these for trial purposes so we don't spend money on it until we know it helps? That's a great, great point. If you are an educational uh, customer. So you're a teacher of the visually impaired and you're interested in getting one to try out with some of your students. Uh, that is absolutely something we can arrange uh, for you. Uh, I'm not aware if there is actually a cost for that. I think for the most part, we do it just to kind of help you out because it's our incentive, of course, is to help you confirm that it does work. Um, in the case of anybody else, uh, you know, obviously, trying these things out by, by viewing them through a distributor or something or going to one of the centers around the country that have our products uh, on display is usually the way you can do it. There is, however, a 30-day money-back guarantee. Uh, I know some people don't want to go through the hassle of doing that, 
but um, but but it does exist because sometimes you get something and it's not right for you. Um, oh, does reveal sixteen? I would add that, yes, yeah, the low vision exam is likely to assess the devices with you as well, and perhaps not every brand that's available, but we would assess the appropriateness and then can also connect you to the vendors uh, locally. Exactly. Uh, so Hope asks an excellent question, and thank you, Hope. I almost forgot this. I would have gotten in trouble if I had. Does Reveal 16 use distance magnification? Yes, it does. Let me turn the camera back towards Reveal. Let me, in fact, I'm going to just do one thing. I need to, first of all, connect the HDMI cabling because I want to show you what it's seeing in a moment. And I'm going to move the screen out of the way just, just for a second. Where my hand is touching, this is the camera. So the camera right now is in a downward position. And if I, if I just lift it up, there's no effort at all. This is very easy to do. I slide it up. Now the camera, can you see, or maybe some of you can see the lens on the front here. So normally that lens is facing down towards the text, but I can move this almost like a periscope. So I'm kind of, you know, angling it up, down, uh, what have you. And now let me go back to um, sharing my screen again, hang on. Hang on, uh, alt tab. Here we go. And let me go ahead, I need to share my screen. All right, so. Right now, I am looking out. I'm going to just reduce the, I'm at a high level of magnification, I think. I might know. So I'm just looking outside my window. If it looks a little grainy, it's because there's an uh, insect uh, mosquito screen behind the glass. But I'm looking at trees in the, in the back behind my house. And I'm just moving the camera with my hands just to see. And so if I then zoom in, so I'm going to kind of go further outside just to kind of see what's there. So I can see leaves on the ground. Believe it or not, this view is completely obscured with green leaves. Once the uh, trees all come through, you can see a little bit of wind outside. The, there's a pine tree out there moving in the wind. Uh, and that's using the, um, the distance view of this device. If I were using distance view from a handheld device, I'd be having to hold the handheld device looking in the direction of outside. So let me come back here, back to me. Um, and then it looks like someone was asking about the, if the webinar was being recorded, which we know that it is. And uh, Alaya from APH confirmed that it will soon be up on the APH YouTube channel. And uh, you go to aphconnectcenter.org, click on the webinars and you can find it there as well. Uh, and then Arlinda, who's a colleague of mine from Humanware also mentions that the YouTube videos for most of our solutions are also on the Humanware channel, uh, which is also on, um, on YouTube. Uh, and comments saying, nice home. Thank you very much. Yes, I am relegated to the third <laughs> bedroom of my house. I'm not allowed to work anywhere else. If I try and take a computer down to the dining room, which is a very comfortable spot because it's closer to food and drink, um, <laughs> I usually get a reprimand, so I don't try uh -oh. it anymore. Yes, but you have so a nice it, view, David, but you have a I, very nice view from there. <laughs> I, I do. Well, you know, what? I have to. It's, it's fine right now. I actually have to close the blind because the sun has now changed direction. And um, so it gets like uh, yeah. overwhelmingly bright. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. But it, and it's worse when it snows because the, the ground oh, is snow yes. covered and the reflection. <laughs> It's, I have to almost wear, you know, uh, transition Sunglasses. lenses. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, so there is another question um, from Elizabeth asking, why didn't the distance show up on the screen of the device? Well, actually um, it did. Uh, it's on both. If I turn the camera, I don't know if you can really see it very clearly here, but uh, there's the outside view right there. So as soon as I turn that camera, by the way, if I was to go back to put the text back underneath, if I move that camera facing down, it switches instantly to looking at the text. Hopefully you can see that kind of side on view. As soon as I lift the, the, uh, the, um, the camera up out of there, it, uh, it starts to magnify what is outside. So it is, uh, it is instant. Um, and the reason that it's on both screens 
So what I'm doing, by the way, is not something, excuse me, what I'm doing with my devices in terms of connecting them to my computer is made possible because I'm using a video game capture device. This isn't how the devices are designed to be used. The idea isn't that you're showing it uh, on, a, on a Zoom meeting. Most people don't have to do that. Um, but, uh, but through the wonders of technology, it allows me to share it so that you don't see any degradation in the image quality. What you're seeing on the Zoom meeting when I show you the screen is the same quality that I'm seeing right here when I'm looking at the screen in my, in my room. Um, so this, and, I, and we probably should have uh, made this comment earlier, by the way. Uh, so this is the first of what we hope will be a series of webinars that we will conduct with Dr. Melkin. Uh, we, 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 we thought of a low vision exam as being something people would be interested in. And I would say that judging by the questions from people, it certainly has proven to be popular. Uh, but are there other topics that you would like to hear us discuss? We're thinking about holding our second webinar in May, so we certainly have time for planning. Um, but if there are other ideas, things that you'd love to do, I mean, we could certainly do a follow-up to this, but, um, but we're thinking maybe something different in the area of low vision. Um, maybe you could type some of your ideas into the chat window, um, or if you, if you don't get a chance to do that, let me share my screen again. Well, while you're me, doing that, David, they yes. can also email their, uh, any ideas or, you know, additional questions to, uh, APH Connect Center, uh, I'm sorry, to Connect Center at APH.org. That would be the email address they could send any questions to, and obviously they can send them to you as well. Uh, absolutely. Or, or, and, or comments or, you know, ideas. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. So um, I just added my, uh, my email to the chat as well, since I had mentioned if people Perfect. needed to reach out Thank to me. You. They can. Thank you, Alexa. That's great. And I did see some ideas already starting to kind of come through. So that is uh, excellent. Thank you. We'll make a note of all of those before we end the meeting today. Um, I did just put up again uh, that slide that I said that I would uh, put up, which is, again, if you, if you contact Humanware or visit our website, uh, you can mention the code VisionAware. We won't penalize you if you use a space. But uh, Vision Aware is the code, and that will entitle you to a 10% discount on any uh, low vision device from here, from Humanware. Uh, you can also use this email address that's listed here, info at humanware.com. So if you do think of other ideas, uh, you can certainly uh, let us know there. We'll be more than happy to cover it in a, in a future webinar. Um, well, I guess given that we did run longer, uh, sorry about that, but we did have a lot of questions and, and hopefully that was a good indicator that people were enjoying uh, the content. So um, thank you very much indeed. It was a pleasure speaking to everybody and I wish you all a pleasant afternoon. Okay. Yes. Thank you. We, it was, uh, it's awesome to get so many questions and, you know, see all the interest that's there and the usefulness of the information, you know, people are really clamoring for this stuff. So thank you um, for presenting all of this wonderful information and, you know, some solutions <laughs> to, to, um, to the, to the issues people are, um, are, you know, facing and dealing with. Um, there are lots of ideas popping up here. <laughs> so that's great. Um, yeah. And the, uh, how about low vision and mobility, uh, household tips from the from the text using devices, I mean, seminar and on options. I mean, this is awesome. This is great. We're getting yeah, some really excellent good ideas. Yeah, excellent ideas. So, um, so yes, thank you, everybody as well for attending and um, being so involved and attentive and putting in questions. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. by the way, uh, 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 yes, just one thing, because I did just notice sure. that um, one of our attendees mentioned that they're not actually able to see the text in the chat uh -huh. um and it was monica i believe and she was asking about the email address for oh. dr melkin uh, okay. i'm not sure if um if dr melkin shared it with everybody or just oh just the panelists uh oh. lexi maybe you'd like to share it again but this time you say all panelists and all attendees and then um all the people will see it and then also yeah read it out that way for those who couldn't see it in the chat yes yeah, perfect so there it is yeah, there it thank is. you um so it's Oh, and Bob McGilvery was on the line. Oh my gosh, Bob, we would have invited you to comment if we'd known you were on. 
I know nice, some nice of these to topics um, should be addressed by Bob McGilvery in the future. Yes. Yeah, Bob McGilvery is, um, is here in Massachusetts, same as Lexi and I, and he is also very, very knowledgeable about low vision devices. Uh, I don't think I know anyone with more CCTVs in, in one room than he has. I mean, it's, it's quite impressive. Anyway, Bob, great to have you here. Uh, nice. Nice, to, nice to chat with you. Okay, everybody. Well, again, my email, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's M-A-L-K-I-N-A at N-E-C-O dot E-D-U. You can also Google my name and my email address is on the New England College of Optometry website. So, Okay, Perfect. great. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, again, thank you for, for your time and presenting all this information, David um, and Dr. Malkin. Really appreciate your time and looking definitely looking forward to um, our next uh, webinar that will be, uh, we're planning it for May. So for all of our participants, please be sure that you visit the APHConnectCenter.org website um, to find out when the uh, next Low Vision webinar um, for Vision Aware will be, uh, will be posted. So oh, you can register. Closing code? Is there a closing I, I, code? I, yes, I will give them okay. the closing code. I just, I, I'm going to, I will, uh, I got to get through some of this information and then we will do the closing code. So again, thank you very much for, for attending. Thank you for presenting and